This is Emily Chamley Wright, and I'm president of the Institute for Humane Studies, as Michael said. It is wonderful to have you all here, and it is indeed my pleasure to introduce John Tomasi, who is the inaugural president of Heterodox Academy. Heterodox Academy works with professors and students to improve the quality of research and education in universities and colleges across the country. And they do that by increasing viewpoint diversity and constructive disagreement. John Tomasi came to Heterodox from Brown University where he built the political theory project, which has mentored some of the brightest minds working in political philosophy and political economy today. And many of those scholars are uh, close in partners with IHS as well. John also brings to his new role a well-earned reputation as a top scholar. He is the author of the influential book, Free Market Fairness, and it draws on, it's, you'll see echoes of the Heterodox Academy mission even in his scholarly work, because it draws on the moral insights of defenders of economic liberty like F.A. Hayek, and also advocates of social justice like the philosopher John Rawls. Now, John has a long, long history with IHS. I believe, John, that your first uh, IHS seminar was in 1988, uh, the same year I think uh, my first seminar was. <laughs> We've been at this for a really long time. And most, uh, and, and the thing that I've, one of the things that has been a high point of my association with IHS for so long has been the fact that you and I got to teach together side by side in a whole ton of IHS seminars. And I learned so much from um, each and every one of those lectures that I was able to sit in on, um, not only content, but also insp inspiring some of my best teaching uh, because I got to uh, be in some sense sitting at, um, at your side uh, while <laughs> witnessing your uh, best teaching. So it is genuinely a pleasure, pleasure to have you here. John, welcome. Thanks, Emily. It's always a pleasure to work with you and IHS, of course, as you know. <laughs> it is, it's, um, it, it just seems like a, I'm going to resist the uh, temptation to walk down memory lane with you here. Um, <laughs> it's a long uh, walk. It would be a long walk. It is. It's a very long walk. <laughs> a little, um, so, little windy, a little windy. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, I do, but I do want to um, uh, talk a bit about your journey uh, to Heterodox Academy but I wanna do it in a way that right from the very start asks you to completely bear your soul, right? Because, you know, being a, making a career transition um, for a professor is not an ordinary everyday sort of thing. It's, it's, you know, being a professor is much more than a profession. It's really a calling, it's an identity. It's sort of like, I think the thing that's, that's perhaps closest um, is like being a monk, you know? So if, <laughs> if, if, you know, if someone leaves the monastery, we don't say, oh, you know, Frank got a new job. We say, brother Frank is leaving the monastery, <laughs> you know? And it's like, like, well, what, something really, really important has to happen for a professor to leave um, uh, his or her university position. What was that something that was so important in your case? Um, do you want the actual answer? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I should first just say I, I loved Brown. I've had a fantastic, I had a fantastic run there and, and I've just, it was a, a really wonderful experience in every way, but I had to leave. And it was no surprise to me that when the chance came, I would leave. And the reason really is, um, just, just, you, you said, bear your soul. So at the risk of bearing my soul, I'll just share with you that, um, uh, my father died when I was very young. Um, I was eight years old. And after he died, um, my mother used to say to me, um, light, at nighttime, she would sometimes sit on my bed and say to me, life is short, Johnny. What difference are you, are you going to make in this world? And I remember, like, for years, really just hearing the first part of that, that statement, that life is short, because it was about my father dying so young. He died when he was 40. And my mom raised me and my three sisters. She never remarried. She raised us on our salary as a middle, middle school art teacher. But my mother said that to me repeatedly. And later on in my life, when I was a young, still young, young person, I started hearing the second part of it. What difference are you going to make in this world? And I've always had those, those two things in my head, like that life is very short. We're not here for very long. And there's a chance to make a difference in the world. And so at the various stops of my life, 
that's always been, I guess it's corny to say it out loud, but it's true. So I'm, I am going to say it because, because well, it's true. <laughs> um, but that's always been really what's driven me. And that's what, drove, that's, that's what drives me sort of in a fundamental way. And along the way, I've, I've, I've had different projects, different things I've been fortunate to be involved with. Becoming a scholar and writing a book about philosophy, especially free market fairness, the one you mentioned is the one I love the most. I have a new book coming out um, next year from Princeton also that you guys might find interesting. It's an intellectual history of libertarianism co-written with Matt Swolinski. So the intellectual life goes on. But with HXA, um, you know, they have my friend John Haidt, who started HXA as a co-founder, um, you know, and HXA approached me a um, little more, a little more than a year ago now. I just thought to myself, there's an incredible asset here that's, in my view, could be potentially utilized, and uh, that's really why I made the decision. Should I say more about about HXA and what the asset is? Yeah. What's the asset? So the asset is um, five thousand professors. And when I first met with the, with the board of Heterodox Academy, I was talking about that 5,000. And I referred to one of my favorite science fiction books, Dune, in which their Paul Atreides, who's this prince, has this opportunity on this strange desert planet. He finds these people called the Fremen, who turn out to be these remarkable um, people, warriors, I suppose. And I remember saying to the board, you know, I. I uh, the, 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 the main asset HX has is these, HXA has is these 5,000 professors at universities all around the world, the ultimate insiders, all of whom are committed to our three principles of open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement. And I remember I said to the board when I first met with them, your 5,000 people remind me of the Fremen. And if only we could mobilize them and organize them and inspire them to peacefully rage across the galaxy maybe we could do something really remarkable. And the board member said to me, who are the Fremen and what is Dune? I've never heard of this book. So, you know, <laughs> you know when, you, when you go out there and you swing, you're gonna miss it. You're gonna miss sometimes, right? So, <laughs> but, but, but in all seriousness, that's, the, that's what really fascinates me about, this, about this, this position and about this organization, that there are now, now 5,500 um, professors who individually signed on to those values. Right. And the way, the way um, Heterox Academy works is very much the way I worked when I was building a center at Brown. Now I sort of think there's two ways to do social change, two kinds of things that need to be done. You have to have people fighting bad things in the world because there are dragons out there and, and you've got to get someone to suit up and go face those dragons. For example, speech codes, things like that. You need to have some organizations like FIRE who go out there and, and, and fight those things and, and um, you know, bring in the lawyers and make, make or free things up in that formal way. But you know, you, the other way to, to think about social change is not just fighting the bad things you find in the world, but just focusing on building genuinely good things. And at Brown, that's what I tried to do with the center I built. It wasn't about fighting parts of Brown that I didn't like. There were some parts of Brown I didn't like, but it was just about trying to build something that, that I think that I hope people could love. And I feel the same way about HXA. HXA, I think, has taken that same approach. We're trying to improve universities by activating the ultimate insiders, the professors and administrators, and trying to hold up, hold up a lant or a, lan a lantern of true commitment to what the university should be. And we're trying in a various ways, not just naive ways, but fairly sophisticated strategic ways to bring our message to the campuses in a form that people can hear. Right. One of our expressions that I love most from one of my colleagues, Kyle Vitale, is HXA seeks to be winsome disruptors. So not just disruptors, right. but something like a winsome disruptor, disruptor, which means to try to um, you know, bring people along with us to bring out the best in their own universities rather than just fighting the dragons that they... That yeah, they you, what I love most about that is that it... One of the things we've done at IHS is we we actively resist war metaphors yeah, uh, yeah. because there, if if you think about it, like what a what a terrible metaphor, uh, you know you hear it a lot the battle of ideas that sort of, that sort of thing and it's like that's a really bad metaphor because the very the, you know 
academic inquiry and the open exchange of ideas is not only not war, it's a, it's the exact opposite of war. It is the antidote to war. It's the it's the way in which we can resolve our differences and 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 tease out our commonalities without having to resort to violence. This is this is a principal way of doing that. And so, you know, we we um, eschew these sorts of uh, warlike metaphors at IHS for that yeah. very reason. And 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 what that opens up to is that sort of I love this language of the winsome um, disruptors, <laughs> um, because it doesn't mean that there isn't tremendous passion for academic virtues and values. And in, in right. fact, it's quite the opposite. Uh, but you can very much be um, uh, someone who is a peace seeker, right? If we're going to think of it, think of it in these terms. Uh, as the way to advance those academic virtues, right? Uh, and and so I, I, I and 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 again, this also sees uh, professors as the as the um, the agents of positive change, which is you know really at the root of of how IHS works as well, which is that that if we can connect scholars to other scholars and they can experience that that exchange of open that open exchange of ideas not only does it advance human progress and intellectual progress it's a hell of a lot of fun yeah, you know yeah. it is the source of real <laughs> joy right yeah, and right. so tapping into that joy and and uh like sort of deep peacemaking as opposed to the sort of notion that there are enemies out there who must be vanquished i love i love that framing yeah and and you know uh, and it's another reason, by the way, not to use the dune metaphor for my Fremen, right? But, 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 but you know, as you, as you were saying about about the war metaphor, you know, war is the ultimate zero sum or <laughs> single sum. And yep. um, if we think about the marketplace of ideas properly understood, then there are all these you know possibilities for constructive. To, our third value at HXA is constructive disagreement, mm -hmm. which to me means something like listening the right way. But, but the constructive part's really important that we disagree constructively and we learn from that. Which, you know, as you, you guys, as you all, you, you and IHS know very well, that was kind of the, the big liberal breakthrough, beginning with the Scottish Enlightenment, but sort of spreading from there, I think. The idea that you could have a society in which people could make progress, not by being brought to all together on one moral view and having that view and going forward as Aristotle right. thought, and as people thought for thousands of years, that's the only way to build a good society is getting an alignment on a view of the good. Everybody has to agree on on what the good is. Otherwise, you're going to fight. Be fighting people. Thoughts. So you yep. need to have authority, and, and you go for the good. And as you know, that we as you know, as we as you and I love to remind ourselves and think about that magical thing about the Scottish Enlightenment was to say, well, is there the possibility of finding rules that would allow differences to coexist, but not merely to coexist, rather by the the strength of our differences can be like fuel for me to pursue the goals that I care about. The more energetically you pursue your different goals, it gives me power and the ability to pursue my different goals in a different direction. That's a positive, some cooperative society. You know, the, the butcher and the baker and all that kind of stuff from Smith is one way to say it. And right. sometimes that's true in the academy as well. And we are, we are um, you know, most of us who got involved in this, in this profession, did it because we're dweebs and we're dorks. And at some point along the line, you know, some questions started just fascinating us. Mm -hmm. And we found, you know, for me, it was philosophy, you economics, you know, the questions just, you know, thrilled us, right? When you oh my God, there's all these strange creatures out there who spent right. their lives becoming experts on this stuff. And they know so much and become, and by becoming a part of that um, discipleship, whatever it is, we, we enter into that conversation. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a great, great thrill for a young person, right? For, for the person you and I were years ago when we went to the IHS seminars and we're both launching our careers. You know, it's an, it's an incredible joy along with the stress, but there's incredible yeah. joy. And that's one of the things that I lament about um, so deeply about the current state of higher education is all the assets that you identified um, uh, notwithstanding, there is a sense in which there's a, there's um, a, a concern that a joylessness is 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 crept in, sure. and you know sure. that there's um, and you know I, 
there's something that's that's changed here you know like like academic freedom has always needed defender defense right um you know from socrates to galileo to mccarthyism we all we always have to be making the case for academic freedom but i do think that there was something that changed right around the maybe 2014 2015 mark mm -hmm. um you know like do, do you agree with that first of all you know you might you might push back on that it's really just the same thing wrapped up in a different different garb um but if the, if there is something that that sort of pivoted um in that in that point um what was it what changed yeah well i'll tell you i'll tell you when i saw it I and mean, i saw things coming for a while i mean you talk about where the ideas came from i mean they came from about 1960 but anyway but the when it, when it hit the campus in this new kind of creature it, it, it was in some ways like when dinosaurs appeared on the stage kind of like a new type of creature was on the was on the on the on the field now in the field of Feel the playing competition, and for me, um, I date it to um, 2013. Mm. An experience I had at Brown that we all at Brown all, all had it, that we at Brown. I think something that happened at Brown, where a speaker, the police commissioner from New York City, uh, former police commissioner from a, from New York City, Ray Kelly, was coming to campus, and as often is the case when controversial speakers come to campus. Uh, some students objected and were worried about him coming to campus and asked that he not be allowed to come to campus. But I, I did wasn't hosting it myself. It wasn't one of mine. But anyway, they brought a group brought Ray Kelly to campus, the police former police commissioner who was uh, infamously connected with um, community policing and later what became stop and frisk. And a group of students who had tried to encourage the university to cancel his talk just went to the talk themselves and they canceled it. So they shouted him down. I was, I was outside in the hallway when the whole thing happened. And uh, there's a bunch of things I could tell you that went on behind the scenes that were pretty fascinating. Um, one was that the, if you look on the YouTube video of Brown, Ray Kelly shout down, the open, it was a scripted lines that they had to begin their, begin their shout down. And I, at the time, the, the group I was running at Brown, the, um, the political theory project was the largest undergraduate student, uh, largest undergraduate student group on the campus, larger even than the college Democrats. These are the students who are really committed to the ideas of openness and free discourse. Anyway, every year that student group had an expression that they would some corny expression they'd come up with, and I'd buy them t-shirts with their corny expression on it just so they could whatever, have a sense of ownership. And their expression, and their, their corny expression that year was, we ask tough questions. But you know, I, I like that one. So I made, you know, made, doodly, made the t-shirt order and gave them their t-shirts. Anyway, when the protesters started their chant to begin the scripted shutdown of Ray Kelly. Their first line, if you watch the YouTube, is asking tough questions is not enough. And then they took that, took that statement from us, then they just ran over all the previous ways the arguments have been run. And the striking thing, the thing that was different and new and unsettling, was the next day after this event happened, a clear violation of Brown's student code of conduct. The, conduct, so the code of conduct says we welcome protests, even angry protests. But there's a line when you stop a speaker from speaking, you can't cross. And the penalty for that is, is severe, it's ejection from the university. But the next day after that event happened, the organizers com were completely open about having done it. They sat for interviews with the student paper and said, well, we told them to shut it down. They wouldn't shut it down, so we shut it down. And they were completely willing to stand there, willing to be identified and kind of dared the university to keep up, to enforce its rules. And it was remarkable. I remember at the time thinking, wait a minute, this is a, this is something different. This is not like we did this, it was over the top. Now we're gonna get you know punished for it. It was more like, we have the arguments on our side and we're gonna hold on to this. And we're gonna face you guys down who think free speech is a good thing. And I can trace the roots of what, what are the reasoning if you, want to, if you want to know what that's about, but that, that to me was really striking. And then of course in 2015, and that's when the, the Yale thing happens with Nick, Nick Krasakis, you know, getting shouted down with the Halloween costumes, then it starts blowing up all over the country. But to me, the first one that I that I was experienced at least was that 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 one with Ray Kelly being shouted down. And again, it was the it was the attitude with which the protesters did it that was fundamentally different. They had the wind in their sails and they knew it. The rest of us didn't even quite see it yet, but by the day after, it was unmistakable that they knew that they were on the that they had the arguments at their at their backs, or at least they thought they did. So there's a there's 
what's changed is that sense of, uh, of a righteousness, a, a sense that we are in the right. That's right. By, by uh, turning on its head, um, what I would call a default liberal principle, which is a default liberal principle in this context would mean, I don't like what you're saying, or I don't, I don't like, like what you've done or said in the past, um, but I need to be tolerant of your point of view, uh, hear you out. Um, and then if, if, if I uh, want to push back, the form of pushing back, the appropriate form of pushing back is to ask tough, tough questions or, or to pose right. a better argument in, in the other direction. I say all that as a liberal default because there's a lot packed in there. Yes. Um, uh, and, and, it's, and it's both sort of a, an understood set of rules of the game but it's also an enculturated um, impulse that it sounds like what, what you experienced were, were students who had a kind of framework, intellectual framework to resist that cultural default of That's that right. liberal default. Exactly. And, right. and that, takes, that takes work. You don't yep, just yep. suddenly get to a new That's default, right. right? There has to be intellectual work or some kind of um, emotional uh, effort to get into this new default. What was that? What was the source of that? I think I know. So, I mean, if we sort of do, do two, two, two jumps back in time. Yeah. 1859, I think it was around 1859, John Stuart Mill publishes On Liberty, which has that stirring defense of, of freedom, the wonderful free speech defense, which is really a defense of the marketplace of ideas. In a variety of ways, and then you, you said you and I said a minute ago, marketplaces can be positive some, and that's a wonderful thing. But you know, I think the really important moment was eighteen, oh, sorry, nineteen sixty-five, when Herbert Marcuse, republic, a Marxist philosopher, um, published a really important essay called Re "Repressive Toleration." And in that essay, Marcuse gave what's widely perceived. Um, I think among philosophers too, but among students certainly at this generation, gave what's widely perceived as a knockdown argument against John Sturm Mill that hasn't really been fully answered yet. And what Marcuse did, Marcuse, he's a Marxist. And so he runs it in Marxist terminology. But he basically says the marketplace of ideas is a mask for power. And the way he actually runs the argument is kind of cool. The way he, he does it, it's, it's kind of hard to read. It's kind of, but if you if you sort of take time, the postscript especially is, is worth, worth looking at. It's kind of a good summary of the, Kind of a hard to read article. But what, what Marcuse does effectively is says, you know, John Stuart Mill's argument? He's right. He's, I agree with him entirely. And in philosophy land, when someone says to their opponent, I agree with everything you just said, <laughs> then you know you're in trouble. <laughs> so Marcuse says, that's right. The marketplace of ideas, you can definitely do that. You can pursue the truth that way. And then he says, however, whether a marketplace of ideas will lead to truth depends upon the background conditions of power. So you can't just play the game of the market and things are, good things are gonna happen. The market is more likely to, as, always, as markets always do, he would say, reflect the pre-existing power structures and just replicate them. So the wealthy use the markets to, get, to keep their wealth. The poor enter the market poor and they leave it poor too. It's a Marxist critique of, of markets. But so too is speech. They run the, they run the speech argument directly with the market argument. And Marcuse says, yeah, you can have free speech lead to open conversations and search for truth. But as he saw it, in a capitalist society, the capitalist class will always own the power to make their speech uh, more, more, more prevalent, more well heard. And the laboring classes will be marginalized in this so-called marketplace of ideas. And so the interests of the wealthy and powerful will just be reflected by the markets as they're always reflected by markets. And if you take that perspective, and you think about Ray Kelly coming to campus, whoever, whoever, was, whoever was on the campus, you can see it as, as just a reflection of the previous of the pre-existing power structures. So that's why they would say things like, well, you know, he's got plenty of, he's already had these wealth, these, these people with, with these famous people, when they come to campus, already had a, a megaphone. We, were, we can already see their, their speech other places. There's no, there's no diminution of free speech by shutting them down. We're just trying to equalize the, the pre-existing power imbalance to make free speech more likely to be, to lead us towards truth. That means shouting down the powerful ones 
It means lifting up the ones who are more quiet. That's kind of the concept. Right. Actually, I mean, there's interesting things that, are, that sort of are, are tied in with that. In this particular case, um, I had a, I was teaching a seminar that that semester with this really fascinating one particular student who was just this fascinating person. And as the Ray Kelly stuff was coming, he told us about his experience. He'd grown up in, in, in the Bronx. He's a black kid from New York. And he told us how in the class, he shared with us how he remembered as a middle school, when he's in middle school, his parents talking with excitement about this thing, community policing. And he, was, he told us in class that he remembered their, his parents saying, wow, they're actually going to start policing our neighborhood and protecting us and our rights so we can walk around safely, finally. Mm -hmm. And they were really excited about that. But then as the policy was implemented and, and it started to morph and change and things started to happen, they started taking on a more of a stop and frisk kind of attitude or a sort of aspect. Mm -hmm. And that student told us that um, a few days after he'd been, he'd been accepted at Brown, he was stopped and frisked for the first time on the street outside his apartment building. Hmm. In New York, when they stop and frisk you, they're not saying, please, sir, uh, you know, don't, if you don't mind, I'm going to check your, no, they, they stop you and they frisk hmm. you on the, yeah. you know, hard. And so he was stopped and frisked, just having gotten into Brown. And then just before coming to, before leaving his home to come, he was stopped again, it happened to him a second time. And so he, the student, couldn't wait for Ray Kelly to come to campus. He actually went to the seminar room about an hour early because his family was all, couldn't believe their son was now going to be in the room with Ray Kelly I was going to get to ask questions and tell them this story about, I remember it was going to be this, but then it became that. And this incredible yeah. thing he had to offer. And yeah. sure. But unfortunately he was shouted down. So, in, so, so there's layers of the game going on, right? right. There's, this, there's this claim that the weak and the powerful need to be up, lifted up and that, the, and that the, sorry, the weak and the powerless need to be lifted up right. and the powerful like Ray need to be brought down. But behind the scenes, who counts as rich and who counts right. as powerful, who counts as weak is complicated, right? If I can just say one more thing about that. Yeah, please. That Marcusean perspective, that critique of John Stuart Mill, which says that markets replicate, just reproduce existing power structures in, in economic domain, but also in the speech domain. You know, that that's that's a very that's that's a deep and powerful argument that powers so much the, the way people see free speech now. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's been I don't think it's been been fully answered. But well, I think one of the reasons why it might not be fully answered is is that there's something to that in, that that intuition, right? Yeah, that that we there don't is. live in a world where power is exercised, you know, sort of like new, neutrally or evenly across society. We've never lived in that world, That's right. and so there's something there's something to that. The right. interesting wrinkle, though, is that power isn't just political power, e economic power. It's also cultural power. Good, good. Right. I mean, so where we are right now is we've got a different form of 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 power being exercised Good. that is both, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, celebrated in some in because if you have felt like you've, uh, you know, been the marginalized and you're now at the center of of um, you're now centered in the conversation, that can seem like an achievement and a victory. but if that just means that you that that group now has more levers of power and they're using it in ways that the old power holders did, this isn't this isn't a, an improved situation. That's great. That's great. I mean, think of think of it, right? I mean, just that 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 Mar the Marcusean argument. It's so ironic that it has such power among students, in part because it's ironic, in part because you know, Mar for Marcuse, it was fairly clear axiomatic about what group has power, what group doesn't have power, because you're right. you run through Marxist economic analysis. If you own capital, you have power. If you don't own capital, you don't you don't have power. But if you think about the forces on campus today, who has the power? At Brown, for example, you know, a university that I, I dearly love, the Brown University is awash with political speech. You can't you can't walk around a corner at Brown without walking to somebody who's talking political speech right in your face. You can't walk through the brown green and put your hand down with someone putting a leaflet in it with some kind of political, <laughs> some kind of political statement about it. So that just, it just goes on and on. I mean, it's clearly very, very political. And yet most of the political views are, are clustered on one side of the ideological spectrum. So the Marcusean analysis, if you run it straight across the way it is now on the contempor most contemporary campuses, it kind of explains why, well, you know, the, you might not, you, the free exercise, you might have free speech, you might get a green light from fire, 
as Brown, for example, has. But the university, but but if you don't have a wide variety of viewpoints, you don't have a, you don't have a culture that really celebrates and looks for contrarianism, that understands the fragility and the inadequacy of what we, our best understanding is now because we're merely human. If you don't see the world that way, if you don't take that sort of truly scientific perspective on the way we hold our knowledge, then you know you live in a world of comfort and the world of where our market's frankly not working. It is just reproducing the, exist, the views that already exist on the campus rather than bringing in new ideas and new, and new challenges. So this irony is, you know, this irony is wrapped with directions, you know, right? Yeah, both directions, right? But, so, I, but, I, but, I, but I do want to say it's, it's really, for me, that Marcuse essay is so interesting from an IHS perspective because it really shows to me the Hayekian point about the power of ideas. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, long dead philosophers and most people listeners may not even know of Marcuse, that essay and all of the students who speak, who, who spout Marcusean skepticism about John Stuart Mill and skepticism of free speech, they're, it's, it's because of Marcuse. He opened that up and mm -hmm. you know, these ideas matter. So nonetheless, though, uh, you're optimistic, right? You, you, in, the, in an interview, um, <clears throat> excuse me, where you, um, uh, just after you accepted the position, you said, um, that about the work of, uh, at Heterodox, instead of focusing on what's wrong with universities, Heterodox Academy invites stakeholders into a positive conversation. What kind of place at their best should universities and colleges be? And so like, I'm thinking about all of the reasons for skepticism, you know, well-founded reasons for skepticism that, that's out there. I'm thinking of the Pew research that says that especially um, right of, you know, people who are on the right of center um, not only have a, a precipitous uh, decline in trust um, and admiration for institutions of higher learning, but there's now a majority that believe that, uh, that higher education is actually doing harm, uh, more harm than good in terms of the strength of, uh, uh, the, strength of uh, the liberal democratic experiment that is the United States. So right. that's, that's chilling to me right and it's and, and i'm sure that you're you encounter this kind of skepticism all the time um how do you speak to the skeptics in a way that um is uh, you know effectively sparks um a light of optimism so there's a lot of data that i could give you but i think i'll just skip that and and um I'll just I'll just share with you a metaphor that I've been working on. And I, I'm I, I'm still not sure about this metaphor, but it's 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 actually kind of how I see the world in this in this part of the world. I think you can think about the academic struggles that we're seeing, the shoutdowns at places like Brown, um, the, the 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 kind of um, the things that have been happening with uh, across like, at Middlebury. I mean, we we can start naming all the various shoutdowns yep. and um, cancellations and um, lots of uh, sort of increasingly restrictive. Forced speech, forced speech on some in many instances now. But I think you can see those conflicts that we're in on campuses in two different from two different perspectives. The first perspective is the familiar one. I think of it as like the battlefield perspective. That's a that's a perspective that we all know from the news and we watch the fights that we're part of. Some of us are part of the fights, and that's a reasonable perspective. That there is something like a battle going on. But the other perspective, the one that I that I actually live in more often is a, a kind of a, a higher historical perspective. I taught a class last fall at Brown, maybe my last class at Brown, called the university. I was kind of prepping, doing some prep work for this, for this job, I suppose. And you know, among the things that we, we were really struck by, we, we, we read the history of universities, a lot of different universities and university systems. And this, on the second perspective on what we're doing, you know, we're, we're, we're all, we're not just battling that we are, from the second more historical perspective, we're all suffering together through this historical period of decades. We're suffering together because we're in the midst of something that we can't really see very well because we're in the midst of it, but, but we're in the midst of a process of giving birth to something that the world has never seen. That is something like giving birth to a university system that is truly inclusive while yet still being deeply committed to freedom of thought, open inquiry and constructive disagreement. If you look back historically at Bologna or Cambridge or Oxford or early Harvard or other universities throughout the American history, 
there have been times when people did pretty well, some universities did pretty well on the free speech open inquiry dimensions. And yet they didn't do very well in other dimensions of, of, of inclusion. And what I sort of see as having done, I mean, women were only included at elite universities, elite Ivy League universities in the 60s and 70s. Like Columbia, for example, was a holdout to 1982, I think. So, you know, there, this is a very recent phenomenon, even with women, uh, never mind other groups. And there's obviously famous cases like in the 1920s with Harvard eliminating the number, effectively eliminating the number, number of Jews, doing different things like the Asian Americans currently as well, it seems. So we're trying to give birth to something in this messy human way with a lot of pain, a lot of confusion and, and, the, and the umbilical cord may be wrapped around the baby's neck, I'm not sure, it's a difficult birth we're trying to, we're going through. But if you think of the, think of what we're doing that way and with that, we're in the midst of a kind of multi-decade process of attempting to give birth to something truly fascinating, truly novel, something that we've never seen before, then it's no surprise that we're feeling pain now. It's no surprise that we're messing it up. And the question I think for HX, HXA, Heterodox Academy, is, is HXA's role is, in that view is something like to be a doula, to be the one who sees, well, what would that, what is this baby? What would it be like? I think it would be a university that would have a real commitment to freedom of thinking, open, open conversations, that would be fully inclusive of, of women and African-Americans and um, um, non-binary people and Republicans and libertarians and Christians and Jews and Muslims <laughs> and just all, you know, yeah. all the kind of groups, right? That we, we now, <laughs> but imagine if you had a university where you actually had that kind of inclusion with that fuller inclusion and we're having those great conversations. We've never seen what that would be like. Yeah. But if we, could, if we could get there, if we can find our way through these puzzles and mis missteps and these screw, you know, these terrible, we're botching it in all different kinds of ways, not surprisingly. But if we could find our way through to that, think what the universities could be. Think of what American universities could be. Think of what they could produce. Think of the kind of education that could be available. If you really had the full diversity of the society, welcomed, fully welcomed within the university walls with those ideals of free expression. I mean, it would be it, the, the prize. If we keep our eye on that prize and think about that, what it would be like, it's much more exciting than the current yeah. stuff is sad and scary. I, I think I, I love this metaphor and I think it, it connects to our earlier part of our conversation because the history of the university has never, we've never really had true diversity with, without, there, that there was, um, that there's always been a, a power dynamic in play, sure. a very sure. serious power dynamic in play. So, so the yeah. history of women in the university is just a, you know exhibit A, um, and exclusion of, of um, minority groups and, and religious groups, you know exhi exhibits B through Z. Yeah. So um, we've never really had a university without that kind of hobbling power structure. That's right. And so That's what especially one at the elite schools. It, Yes. Especially at the elite schools, interestingly. Yes. I mean, there, there, were some, there were some progressive outliers. I mean, Oberlin, for example, had women and, and African Americans uh, admitted on, on the meritocratic grounds in the 1850s. Right. But right. Not, Har not Harvard and Princeton and Yale. And Brown. So, so <laughs> what? And so, you know, we, we've got um, some prototypes, right, of, you know, in, in throughout the history. But if the metaphor is to give birth to something entirely new, it, it the entirely new part of it really is a genuine and, and genuine diversity, but without power. Without the imbalances of power. So something like something yeah. like something like a fully inclusive university that's truly committed to viewpoint diversity, constructive disagreement. I talk to people sometimes. I'm sure you do too. People who talk about the good old days when they were at university. And now they have these conversations late into night, and these days their kids are are don't want to talk about stuff or they're afraid to talk about stuff. And I think people who talk like that are onto something important. They're right to think that there was something wonderful. Those memories they have of those late night conversations or the class they took their freshman year where the two professors talked together and had different viewpoints. You know, those are wonderful. Those are ideals. Those are true ideals for us to aspire to. And yet if you think about that ideal supercharged into the context of deeper diversity, I sort of, I have, I have an essay that I've, I'm playing around with that I haven't published yet. It's called Deep Heterodoxy. And I, what it is, I take Heterodox Academy's values 
open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, constructed disagreement, and posit it into a university where there's pretty much homogeneity within the university, white males of a certain class mainly. I think what a great university that would be, it could fully achieve the HXA ideals. But then that started adding groups, adding groups to it, adding add women, add Jews, add Catholics, add Protestants, yeah, add, add evangelicals, add Republicans, add Marxists, add all the different you know, libertarians, all, all these different kinds of people, different viewpoints. And you supercharge it and you get something that I call deep heterodoxy. And deep heterodoxy, we, we haven't seen yet. And like mm -hmm. I said, it's um, you know, even, even, even exemplar, early exemplars that were kind of on this interestingly progressive track, like Oberlin, they, in recent years, they've kind of gone <laughs> a less, a less, less, lesser, less um, progressive directions, it seems to me, very authoritarian. I'm not, I'm not calling them out in particular, but they're, 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 they're one among many that are like that, I think, that have those tendencies sort of threatening to become ascendant. But again, so how do we approach that? And we see the world going, this is like Hayek and the crowd back in the, in the 1950s when the world was turning its back on liberty. They saw through to the possibility of what could be, and they kept that light alive. So the time when the time was ripe, it could be here. And that's where I see us now. That's I see us, um, all of us, uh, people who are like my adversaries at Brown and my allies at Brown, we're all str struggling and suffering together to try to make this thing happen. And I see in the free, we on the free speech side see parts of it more clearly. People on the race side see other parts of it perhaps more clearly than we do. And you know, together using the million approach that none of us has all the truth. You yep. know, we, or, if we approach that with humility about our own our own views. We're heading toward in a direction for something wondrous, but we still don't know what it's going to look like fully when it arrives. We're just working our way through a bloody operating room, trying to and get birth the, And the end game here is not just a better university, I would argue, that, that, in, that in many ways that, um, and this is where I was going to, um, uh, my closing question, uh, which I think you've just answered is, you know, what do universities owe a liberal democratic free society um, yeah. that, that, you know, when, when, you know, in, at the, at the dawn of the American experiment, higher education leaders really got this connection between liberal learning and a, and a self-governing citizenry. They, they were explicit in founding documents of universities that, that, that were um, established at, at the time of, in the, you know, post-revolutionary period. There's that that clear awareness, and so uh, you know, does that does that um, obligation for universities to play a role in the success of the liberal democratic experiment? Um, what what's the contemporary um, debt that uh, that that in institutions of higher learning owe? I think it's something like what you've just said here is to provide a model for how very very different people can live peacefully and productively and creatively together. That's right, that's right. And it relies upon, that, that liberal democratic model relies upon an idea of social progress that it's itself under attack right now. And the idea of the progress in which that, if you think about HXA's three values, open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, constructive disagreement. Each one of those has a political analog. HXA is a non-partisan, non, non ideologically non-partisan group. You have equal members from Republicans and Democrats, for example, but those principles, open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, constructive district, they all parallel. Open inquiry is parallel to individual liberty. Um, viewpoint diversity is a parallel to toleration. Constructive disagreement is a, a parallel to something like democratic deliberation. And there's an ideal of social progress, roughly liberal democratic, this says we make social progress through arguments, through convincing, and we do it together. We get there not because, not through force, not through cramming down people's throats. It's not class warfare with the right, there's good people and there's bad people and, you, and the good fight against the evil and vanquish them and kill them, you know, a la Marx, whatever, you wanna run that. This is the idea that we work together and talk together and work together peacefully in positive some ways to move forward together. And there's a real, there's a real challenge to that whole liberal democratic approach alive in our country now. This is that having the truth, a young student arriving on campus, having some view about climate change or a view about race, whatever it might be, even if that view turns out to be true, if they don't have a sense for the importance of the arguments, if they don't have an importance for the sense of them having holding those views for the right reasons, then in some way their views are defective, even if they turned out to be true, for example. 
So that's what universities are meant to be about. They're meant to be about deepening, the, deepening our understanding. So it's not just tracking truth or not tracking truth. It's tracking truth together through conversation and disagreement and deliberation, and sometimes deliberating down and dirty. But that's an ideal that a lot of people are, are, are skeptical of. And if we can't defend it at the universities, how are we gonna defend it in the, wider, in the wider society? When that threat comes, when that challenge comes, it's on our doorstep now, I think. When those ideas and those challengers come to liberal democracy itself, we're first seeing them on the campuses. And how do we meet them? Do we battle them and shoot them down? Or do we embrace them and invite them into conversations and tell them things like, you know, Marcuse has got a brilliant philosopher, good for Marcuse. Let's agree, he's got a great move with J.S. Mill, but let's now apply his ideas in our own society together. Let's look at our campuses through Marcusean eyes, if you like, and then Millian eyes too. And I think that's the more powerful approach. That's the approach that HXA takes. And it's, it's like, it's, it has the power of water. We try to open up spaces for conversations, even conversations some people don't wanna have because we believe we can have them and do them together and bring people together through them if you do them the right way. So that's, that's, why, that's sort of what I, that's why I'm doing what I do. Well, that's a perfect note to transition. Then I'm gonna bring Michael Broderick back in to um, uh, moderate our Q&A period. And um, this Hi, has just been so delightful. Hi, John, and thank you, Emily and John, for a wonderful and uh, vibrant conversation. And thank you also to the viewers who submitted interesting questions for John. Uh, just to get us started, since we've been talking about Marcuse, John, you mentioned the Marcusean argument about free speech hasn't been fully answered, but you and Emily both went on, and I think admirably, to argue for an inclusive and free speech oriented university. Right. Still, I think you could have a skeptic who might say that that can't happen until the speech of the currently powerful has been brought to heel. Can you talk about how one could or should uh, respond to that sort of skeptic? Um, when you say brought to heel, do you mean canceled? <laughs> that, counter, would be, counter canceled. <laughs> that would be the most extreme form of, of, of it, but it could be, uh, 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 well, there, could, there may be other ways in which the speech of the powerful can be curbed. And one could argue that that's a necessary condition of the sort of university environment that I think we all in this room hope for. Well, I guess I would say it a little, I, I, I like that formulation. I, I would tweak it a little bit. Um, I think one of the things we need a, a clear understanding of is the distinction between free expression and free speech and something that I called the speech appropriate, the speech appropriate at universities. And the speech appropriate at universities is something that I called, I'm sure you like the name, but this is what I call it, Emily, disciplined speech. So free speech means say whatever you want, go nuts, you know, whatever, any view you have, toss it out there and we'll do, do, what, we, do what we will with it. Discipline speech is my attempt to describe a certain kind of speech appropriate to universities that is um, elite in the sense that it's informed by, by mainstream findings across the dis disciplinary fields. So if you're interested in climate change, for example, or interested in the new Green New Deal and you're about university believing that, at university, you should learn some things about opportunity cost, for example, just what, what it is. So when you talk about policy issues, you should have some sense for trade-offs. You should have some awareness of the history of what model, what, what's a climate model? How do they run in different ways? Why, why is there some, why is there, what does it mean to have a consensus in science? What are the edges of consensus? Those are kinds of ideas that one gets from disciplines. And at universities, part of our job is to refer to those disciplinary findings so our speech is more sophisticated than it would be if we're just out on, 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 the, on the commons. The university is a place for a very special kind of speech, a very special kind of listening, a very special kind of hierarchy, I suppose even, a kind of epistemic hierarchy. We're actually trying to think together, well, what's the best we've come up with so far? Always being open-minded to path dependencies of disciplines, knowing that they go certain ways for certain kinds of reasons, not always, not always truth tracking, but that there's some, respect one should properly have for the great disciplinary findings, especially mainstream ones. And that education at a university is about learning those discipline, learning things about those disciplines, 
and then applying them when one has viewpoints, rather than just coming in with a view, hammering the table because you know it's true. At the university, we don't care so much about that. We wanna know why you think what you think. We wanna see if you're more, you can be made more sophisticated and make us more sophisticated in our beliefs that we hold to. So I, I call it disciplined speech. I'm not sure it's going to, I probably won't catch on because it sounds a little constrained, but anyway, there it is. Well, thank you. And, and speaking about free expression, especially as it takes place on campus, can you talk a little bit about how we can make a case for the values of free expression and intellectual diversity in a context of affective polarization? So a context in which individuals may see their political opponents not merely as people of goodwill who are sadly mistaken, That's but right. as, as bad actors. Right. Um, how can we overcome that perception that, that free expression somehow entails compromising with bad actors? It's, it's a tough one. It's a very tough one, especially in an era where truth is under attack the way the very idea of truth is under attack from the left and the right, it seems to me, in American culture. There's a real skepticism about this, that idea that I mentioned before about the possibility of neutral disciplined speech. When I talk with my, some of my friends about disciplined speech, they say, yeah, you're gonna get the same reproductive, we're gonna reproduce the ideological imbalances that are infecting all the disciplines now. And that is part of the, the reality of the challenge, I think, of having an ideologically imbalanced academy. Um, but I, I think we just have to sort of find our way to, to, to remind ourselves, well, what is the universities are for? They're not normal place, places for normal speech. They're not zones of free speech simpliciter. There's a very special places. I think of the, I think of the university as being like a garden for curiosity, a uh, garden for where people can, can explore ideas that, that interest them just because they interest them. And to have that garden work, it needs to be walled off from the ordinary run of politics and the ordinary, ordinary run of political speech as well, it seems to me. We have to have epistemic walls around the garden so that politics can be talked about at universities, but the way we make decisions should, shouldn't merely be political in the way politics works. We're in, and in politics, of course, disinformation and exaggeration and extreme claims are this, that's ordinary stuff of politics. The universities need to be aware of that, those things as being like weeds in the garden of curiosity. They need to be kept out, which means it does mean disciplining ourselves about a certain kind of speech is not being appropriate within universities and a certain kind of politics not being appropriate inside universities. Precisely because those kinds of politics which deny truth from left and right, again, they, they are eroding what's, what's truly marvelous about universities, that this is a place we come together to try to enlarge our understandings. That means making ourselves vulnerable in front of one another, explaining when we don't understand something, raising, raising our hands and being honest about that. But that's how leaps happen. Um, it happens with students and it happens with scholars too. And those are the norms we need to get. It's, it's going to be increasingly difficult, I think. HXA is sort of doing some mapping out and, and you know, we're concerned about the polarization that if you claim, claim to be for free speech, you start getting labeled as an, as an ideologue in some way. And that's one, of the, that's one of the tactics and tricks of politics, which we have to also call, out, call it out for what it is and take it on strongly in a principled way, but positively, in my view, is the, strong, is the strongest way to do that. Since we have only a few minutes remaining, let me ask you about HXA. Um, you're, you've just come on board as the inaugural president of, H of HXA, High Heterodox Academy. There's opportunity on the horizon. Uh, can you give us a glimpse of you know, what's, what's next for Heterodox Academy? Sure, so when I took over, the main asset was the 5,000 members. But the way the, I was interested when I first took over that um, membership was anonymous. And my idea, my Fremen-like idea, is to activate the membership and make us more, um, more present on the campuses. And then my first step was to say, well, I'm gonna, I wanna make, require that every member actually be identified on our website. I thought it was like the first step that one would go through just to sort of activate the membership. And when I did that, I was talking with a friend who teaches at an elite Ivy League school that I won't name. And this person has a, a, a long-term non-tenured position there and she's, she's a member of HXA. And she said to me, as I was toying with this policy, she said, if you do this, I'm gonna have to quit. Not because I'm embarrassed to stand up for those three values, viewpoint diversity, open inquiry, constructive disagreement, 
but because if you're known to be willing to stand up for those values and be named, you become a person of interest and you start to be watched. So she, she said to me, if you make that rule, I'm going to quit. But then I actually watched her have a second thought. And she, the second thought she had is, wait a minute, if we do this new rule, she's finally going to find out something she's wanted ever for, for years. Who else on my campus is a member? So we passed that. I passed the rules. My first act is HXA's new, pre, new president. I think we lost 200 people the first night, 300 the second day. I didn't sleep at all. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm sinking this organization. But then it sort of stopped. And we started rebounding and rebuilding. Now, now we're back up over, over 5,500. So we got, we, got, we got them back and more. But that's the first step. For me, that's the first step about trying to bring people together. And what HXA fundamentally does is not just affirm these beliefs. We have been a, like a lighthouse affirming these beliefs for years. But under my presidency, what we're going to do now is not just, we're going to not just affirm our beliefs, we're going to act in a certain way. And our primary activity is to bring people together who have these views to invite others who are skeptical, skeptical of them into conversation and to really bring, make universities at places where conversations about these values happen. We wanna make the question, we wanna have the conversation about the Marcusean objection. We wanna have those conversations openly, energetically, in principled ways. And then we will make universities a little more sophisticated in the way they make choices. We'll call out the political actors when they're being political. We'll remind people that we are trying to, trying to seek knowledge and truth together. And that means certain kinds of tactics are just tactics and they, should be, they shouldn't be given any special protection or, or esteem. They should be called out for being weeds in our garden and chucked back over the wall. Those ideas should be chucked back over the wall when, they erupt, when, we, when we find them. So it's gonna take some principled work, but I'm, but I'm optimistic. It's gonna be a slow, hard, changing institutions is a slow, long game. That's, how, that's just what it is. At HXA, we're not just changing the rules. We're not lawyers. We're trying to change the culture we're working to change the way people think, the way they teach. And our 5,000 professors are beginning at home in their own classes, what they, what they communicate to their students in their classes. And now they're starting to reach out to fellow, fellow colleagues across the campus and encourage them to join us too. Especially those who are critical of or skeptical of us. We're trying to show them by our way, by the way we are in the world, that they can join us because we're serious and we're not gonna stop. We're gonna go on and do this. And it's not always gonna be easy. There's gonna be some blood, but lovingly, we hope we can be part of this historic process, producing this amazing thing that the world's never seen. It will be a remarkable accomplishment. If we, and if we can be part of it, what a special thing. I think that's the last question we have time for. So thank you, John, so much again for being with us today. And thank you again to the viewers for submitting their questions. I'm going to turn the floor back over to Emily to close us out. Thanks, Michael. And thank you, John, for joining us today. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for being such a terrific partner to IHS as well, um, uh, both individually as a scholar, but also uh, we're so excited to be in partnership with Heterodox Academy here at IHS. The work that, uh, that we are able to do together is really the work that is the foundation of a society that is the good society where, where Michael led us off. It's a society where we invite the values of pluralism. We invite the values of intellectual openness. That's how human progress evolves. And that's how we can, and the way to do that is to find that common ground that you've laid out so, uh, so persuasively that there is so much good in uh, good to be found in higher education, especially if we start recognizing each other in the room as being committed to the to those uh, academic values of openness and the joy that can be found in that exchange. So thank, thank you for all the work that you're doing, thank and you. thank you for the work that you do with IHS as well. Thank you. It's it's an honor, Emily, as you know. Thank you. Thank you.